the charge to those who God taps on the shoulder to stand in the pulpit must teach people from this book who God is, what God wants of us, why we're here. You answer those questions. Failure to do so, by the way, produces a little bit of where we're at right now. You might say, tell me your logic on this one. Well, I'll give you the same type of logic. All you got to do is look at our school-aged children. American children have now finally ranked pretty much at the lowest globally for instruction. And what do you think that's going to do for our country in if this country is still here in 20 years or 30 years when these young minds are adults? What do you think that's going to produce when they can't read a clock, an analog clock, when they cannot do math, they don't know history because 90% of the time in school is spent talking about gender. My point is, though, what will happen to these young minds who are not being molded, taught, instructed? God help this country if we survive another 20 or 30 years for what is coming up. And unless these young people are guided by parents who value the future of this country and their children more than just putting them in whatever school it is and walking away and saying, okay, now you babysit my children while I go and do whatever. That's the problem we have. Now, if you don't think that that applies into the spiritual, let me show you. Because we've been talking about how we got to where we are in the church world. Now, I'm not Catholic, and most of my listeners are not Catholic. But let me read two articles I printed out. They're both from the USSA News, a little unknown outlet, but this is the headline. Pope Francis blames humans for earthquakes, claims carbon emissions cause natural disasters. This is my point. If we are not educating God's children on what matters and we start talking about nonsense, really it's demonic, But if we start talking about nonsense, let me ask you this question, because I think most of us here are not scientists. We're not climate experts. We're not even geologists or anything that's specialized. There may be one person in the sound of my voice, but that's about it. But we've had earthquakes in this planet, on this land, under the earth. And anybody who knows why earthquakes happen, and there is actually a scientific explanation for that, that... The leader of the largest religious outlet, if you will, is blaming people for earthquakes based on emissions. Well, the only emission that I smell is what's coming out of... (laughs) This one I'm going to read to you, though, because it bears you seeing what's going on in the world. Here's the headline. You all know what WTF means? Well, I'm I'm not saying it. It's right there. WTF, question mark. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. (laughs) Pope declares Klaus Schwab is, quote, more important than Jesus Christ. That was posted the day before the one I just, the headline I just read. The spiritual horizon seems clouded as Pope Francis remarks paint a disconcerting image. According to him, The world's path to redemption might just lie in the vision of Klaus Schwab, the World Economic Forum's founder, and might I say also resident and largest demon in a human container I've ever seen. If you don't know who that person is, look it up. This is the person that is telling people you'll own nothing and you'll be happy, all right? the plan to wipe out religion, wipe out anything. You'll all be given $100, have no home, no car, and you'll be happy. That's his mantra, among other things. To many, it appears that Klaus Schwab's significance now overshadows even Jesus Christ in this modern age. The Pope's perspective, you ask? Jesus sought salvation for souls, while Schwab's aim is a world where fewer souls prevail. These words have sent ripples through the corridors of the Vatican, stirring discord and concern. The crux of the matter isn't merely Pope Francis's apparent endorsement of Schwab's controversial ideas, but the underlying implication that comes with them. The question on everyone's lips, why is the Pope, now, I, 
I hate to even read this. Why is the Pope the spiritual compass for millions? That's an opinion, I guess. Aligning with global figures known for their far-reaching ambitions. His recent collaboration with Bill Clinton advocating for a significant decrease in the human population further muddles the waters. Even more confounding is his message to the faithful. Intimate connections with Jesus are a pat fraught with peril. This startling departure from age-old Christian beliefs has led many to wonder about the authenticity of his papacy and motives behind his statements. Peeling back the layers, one may question where, where Pope Francis's true allegiances lie. Marine Le Pen, a French, the French presidential candidate, suggests he's nothing less than, quote, a globalist bulldog committed to the goals of the new world order. Revelations from WikiLeaks adds fuel to the fire, suggesting that Pope Francis' elevation to the papacy was orchestrated by global players like George Soros, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, subsequently the Pope's advocacy for a one-world government, and his ties to the United Nations agenda make his position increasingly clear. Shocking events in the Vatican, such as hosting Islamic prayers and the Pope's own participation in Islamic rites, challenge traditional Christian beliefs. And his participation in an interreligious conference calling for religious pluralism directly contradicts biblical teachings. It appears the Pope's advocacy for the one world religion is steadily becoming a reality. A historic covenant signed by Pope Francis promotes the view that all religions, including Islam, hold equal significance in the eyes of God. Yet one must question, is the aim genuinely about unifying humanity, or does it hint at a darker future where wealth and power remain concentrated while the majority are surveilled and controlled? Speculations run wild. Cardinal Jorge Bigolio's rise to the papacy in 2013 sparked rumors fueled by uh, some prophecies suggesting that Pope Francis might be the Antichrist. The alignment of several coincidences with the prophecies add weight to these claims. Anyway, you get the idea. So I go back and I digress to a question that I just asked you about our school-age children. Well, how about the children of God and the millions that flock to the Catholic Church? And this is what they are being, I'm sorry to say it like this, this is what they're being governed by. Someone who is committed to the globalist, to one world order, who obviously has debased and, in my opinion, blasphemed completely our Lord and Savior by even putting anybody on an equal plane, let alone the individual that I'm discussing. And you expect future generations of Catholics, which do indeed, some of them call themselves Christians, do you expect a future generation of God's children to be raised up knowing this book? or the globalist playbook, because that's what, this is what I'm trying to explain. We are at the crossroads in this country because the church has failed. And the church has failed not because Jesus failed or God failed, but because the church has been infiltrated. It's been infiltrated. It, this has been going on for a long time. It's just now come to the front of things where people can actually see it, where Jesus takes back seat to globalism and agendas that are being promulgated everywhere which have no business being in the church of Jesus Christ. So I'm asking you, if our own school-age children who are not receiving the proper education to grow up and become adults and make this nation great, a nation of great thinkers from the most menial to the most intelligent, how do we expect to keep a faith that now is no longer rooted in anything, let alone all the traditions it's got itself muddied in. But what will be produced from this arm of the church in the future? Well, I'm asking the question. If you don't educate God's children about God, what are they going to be educated on? Well, they're going to be educated on how earthquakes happen, erroneously, and how globalism Wokeism, every agenda, syncretism should all be included within the body of Christ. And you tell me there's not a problem. These are the things we have to ask ourselves. If you're in a place where, as I've said this before, it seems now very old for me to say this, but if you're more concerned about the entertainment or the fringe things that 
should not even be a concern, you're in the wrong place today. And I would highly recommend you don't come back because I'm here with sleeves rolled up like I do every single week, ready to teach and talk about the stuff that actually should matter to us as Christians. So let's get started. I'm sorry, I've taken up so much time, but there's a lot of times where I think you need to hear where I'm coming from. Sometimes that does a lot of good to understand. I'm not just standing up here disconnected from things. I'm very connected, but I have to choose when and where. So if you brought your Bibles or you have your Bible at home, please open your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I'm going to start reading at verse 24 because it gives the context, but we'll be looking at verses 25 and 26 as the launching pad for this message. So it says here, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all. You notice that men is italicized. Again, I shouldn't have to say this, but the italics were added by the translators. All is all, men and women, okay? Apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So we need to start by looking at the verse and picking it apart a bit. The first thing I want to talk about is the word meekness. I've spoken on this before, but I have so many new listeners, it bears that I would repeat this again. The Greek word right here, brauteti, which is being translated in your King James, meekness, in fact, you've got the little particle here, in, which would be our in English in, prateti. So let me start by talking about this word because it is never understood properly. I have described this word in times past as, imagine if you've ever seen a champion horse and the rider has the, obviously, bit is in the horse's mouth, bit and bridle to control. Now... There are two dynamics here. If that horse comes to the knowledge that it can run free, trust me, it would kill the rider in a second. I'm not saying all horses, but take it from someone who knows horses pretty well. You also have the rider. If the rider is too strong with their hands, it just takes a little gentle something to tug on the horse's tongue to give cues. Now, this word for meekness, imagine, is full power, throttle open, but under control. So maybe a better way to describe this, you've all seen martial artistry, martial arts. You'll see someone who has maybe a smaller masculine, more a smaller figure, does not look that menacing. You see them walk around, doesn't look that. But if you know what they're capable of doing, they're capable of killing. And yet when they're practicing, a lot of times it's very light. You know, you, you'd look at that in practice and say, that can't kill. Well, yeah, that, if, if the whole power is unleashed, that's power being held back, being reserved, being restrained. That's what meekness is. Meekness is not milk toast. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is full power, but the restraint in not engaging it. Now, so the first thing we're told here is in meekness. Now, this is instructions, by the way, the uh, first and second Timothy is often referred to, if you like commentaries, as the pastorals. And there's a reason. Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy is not a church. He's a person. And I've already addressed this many times, and every time I address this, there'll be people saying, how do you know that? How do you know that? Timothy was a weak individual. He didn't have, I just said chutzpah, so let's use that. He didn't have the chutzpah that one typically would need in order to pastor a church. So, as I've said many times, rich widows, for example, would push him around, and it was not as though he would exercise his right, especially at the time they're living in, to say, sit down and shut up. He listened to them. A lot of his acts are not made clear unless you're understanding why Paul is having to write to him to get him to do his job. I know that sounds a little strange, but that's the bluntest way I can put it. So 
the first part of this I want you to see as should be understood as instructions to the minister, but yet this bleeds over to everybody, and you'll let me, I'll show you how this works. So let's first look at this word pratete, which in your King James is being translated meekness, and let me just say here, if you are a Strong's person, that's the concordance that goes along with the King James Bible. This word comes from 4240, from the word, let me write it in English, it's easier for most of my audience, prautis, from the Strong's 4239, mildness from praus, and the root of pra, pra, which is very interesting because this root emphasizes the divine origin of the meekness. I've never said that before because I had to do a little peeling back to find out I wasn't quite satisfied. I, I've always said that that controller, that governor, that's God. So this, the PRA, if you want to call it a prefix to the root or whatever, it lets you know it is, there is a divine origin in this. It means that we in ourselves, in the natural, are not capable of this unless God puts that in us. All power, but reserve. And it's the power of God. It's not the person's power. So let's just get that out of the way. Now, because this is a noun, and it's in the dative, all I'm going to say to you is this would become more of a state of mind. So think of it that way. So let's look at this next word. Some of these should be familiar to you. Pai du onta. That's the best phonetical way I can put that. Looks a little strange. All right, so we get our English words, for example, pedagogue, from this word. It is essentially from the word, the verb paideo. If you're looking up Strong's, it's 3811. To train a child, instruct by training, educate, teach, correct, chastise. And let me just show you how in English we can end up with different words. For example, from Luke 23, 16 and also 23, 22, it reads chastise by punishment as translating this word pedionta. However, if you look up Acts 7, 22, it says Moses was learned. So it isn't always punishment or chastisement, but it could definitely fit into the category like the book of Hebrews says he learned obedience by the things he suffered. It could fit into that category. So teaching, being instructed, it can connote to correct, to teach, to chastise. But it can also say or explain learning. So we are to teach full power, but kind of keep that in check. So we're not, we're not going crazy on people. We're not lording it over people. We're not pointing at people and calling people out. We are to teach which could contain the concept of learning, the concept of correction, the concept of punishment. All those can be included. I'm just breaking down the Greek first. Tus, so tus here, the ones. I'm sorry, I should put the English here, that would be helpful. So I'll do that afterwards. And we're, gonna, we're going to translate this word as instructing. And then here we have this interesting word I'm trying to see oppose, that oppose themselves. So you got to look at this word. It's quite interesting, and it's got several parts to it. Let's do this in a different color. Anti, dia, let's put that into chunks there. Does anybody not know what the word anti means? Against, in opposition, right? Dia, through, and tithimenos, which we would classify, if you've got to kind of get this mindset, it's almost like if I'm going to take the word and break it down, it is anti-covenant almost. But you'd have to break down the three parts to see that. In meekness, instructing or teaching the ones who are against opposing. And the reason why I'm putting this out there is because they are opposing, and this is where you have to hear me out, they're either opposing what needs to be taught, which there's plenty of that. If you read the bulk of Second and Third Timothy, you'll see there's good reason to go there, that people were against what was being taught. 
but also hindering themselves because they cannot have an open mind. So, and this will become clear. I'll go back and explain why understanding this is important. So just bear with me for a minute because there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, if perhaps may grant or give doe, autois, them, and here we have Theos, God, you should know this word, repentance, ice into or to the knowledge, and let's put here, of the brackets truth. All right, so the reason why I'm doing this will become clear, I hope, now. If you read the King James, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them the repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So the first thing I want to address is this in meekness. How many times have we seen, and I think it was, um, I think it was so, so you know I address everything. I'm not just a Catholic uh, I don't have just have Catholic issues, all right? This was a Baptist minister. You say, well, yeah, pastor, you're great at making friends with people, aren't you? Yeah. But you'll know who I'm talking about. They were the church that went out and they protested uh, at the graves of the dead servicemen. Do you remember that? Yeah. Okay. That leader, I'm sorry to say it like this, but this is exactly not the meaning. Pratete is not full throttle. Now you get out and you start boycotting and you start condemning and you start yelling at and you start... It's, that does not mean that. And unfortunately, you have ministers, and I know I've got a lot of ministers, pastors, and even a couple of priests and rabbis that follow every single week. We are to have full power, and that when I say full power, I mean God is backing the speaker, but you're not engaging in, you're not doing this. I mean, you're not pummeling people. You are coming across with the information. Sometimes it needs to be broken down a little bit easier to masticate and digest, but there's a delicate balance in this. And the reason why, if I said the background, the reason why Paul is writing to Timothy, if you read back a little bit, you'll read that there were people, specifically Hymenus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection's already passed, and there were a lot of people coming into the church trying to derail it. They'd come in either very, very, we'll call it syrupy and loving, and, you know, you brothers and sisters, you're all going the wrong direction, or they'd come in and they would be full, full orb, full power, and not of God, of the flesh, perhaps, to confuse people. So there is something here to make clear. Now, let me just say, the, the word for paidonta, instructing, let's just say that a person needs correction, and it is the pastor's job. Make no mistake about it. Somebody spiritually gets out of line. That's why we talk about the shepherd or the under-shepherd and the sheep. And you don't have a shepherd going around trying to convince a sheep, well, you're a good little sheep, and I know you didn't mean to stray, and, you know, come on, and, and let's rationalize with the sheep. No, it's, it's here's the crook, the little thing that you might pull and get the sheep back in the fold, or the stick that you might give a good whacking to verbally uh, to get them back into the fold so that they're out of danger, right? So this word carries a lot with it. People don't understand that, Instruction is a thing that a lot of people are not willing to do. Because what comes with instruction, as I said, could be correction, could be punishment, but let's just talk about it as teaching. Sometimes people are, they resist the truth, and that's what's being addressed right here. They resist the truth, they don't want to they don't want to know about it. They they come in and they're no I I see, trust me, I unfortunately I see this all too often, people who are experts, they'll tell you, they'll tell me, oh, no, no, uh, this is the way the church, or this, this means that. They're experts, but yet, no, you can see how not expert they are. So 
when you talk about teaching, I want you to keep in mind it's a broad spectrum of things that all basically come back to correction, instruction, education. There's never anything here that talks about anything else. This is why I said to you, if you're not in a church, and I'm specifically talking to people who are not in this building, if you're not in a church that is a teaching ministry, I don't care if you listen to me, find it somewhere. Go find someone who will teach you, who's more concerned about you learning than about being liked. Because what comes with teaching is also being very unpopular. People sometimes will, no, and they become extremely dogmatic. They'll even double down, even when you show them. Hey, listen, I don't have anything more to say here. If I've opened up a verse and the verse says this is that and you can't accept that, then that's your problem, not mine, because that's what God's word says. So the teaching part of that requires full power but under control. Never think that means that the preacher or the teacher or the pastor somehow is a pushover. That actually would almost be the antithesis of what's being said here. But yet, when people read this, that's what they think. Meekness. Oh, you must come in, and you must be uh, demure, and you must not offend anybody, and you must... Now, granted, look at what comes right before. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all, apt to teach, patient. And if you have a Bible like mine, it says forbearing, and trust me, I have been very forbearing. Never mind. If you haven't been around, it won't matter. All right. So let's get back into this for a second so you can see what I'm saying. So that God might give to them, that he might grant to them repentance. The word we use in English, unfortunately, repent, comes from the Latin, which is not the meaning of the Greek word, the language that this book, at least the bulk of it, was written in, the New Testament. So this word metanoia is split it in two, meta, with, and noia, the mind. So metanoia means a change of mind. It means once I have received the truth, and I'm able to receive the truth, my mind now, I start, I'm going in a different direction. I'm no longer going according to my ideas, my thoughts, my dogmas, but yet when I have been exposed to the truth of God, there should be a change of mind that says, oh, I, I was wrong. This is not the place where you feel bad, where all the feelings of grief and guilt and sadness because you've, whatever. That's not, this is not that word. There's another word for that in the Greek that is metamelomai. That means all the feelings that accompany once somebody's changed their mind and they realize how backwards and wrong direction they were going, then the grief of the mind and the heart that begins to come, and that's also given from God, that they might come to change their mind to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, how can anybody come to the knowledge of the truth when the truth is in, rooted in Christ? He is the truth. He is the way. He is the life. He is the light. He is the bread that came down from heaven, the manna of God. How can anybody... Just simple, how can you come to repentance and the knowledge of the truth when the truth is nothing but a bunch of blasphemous lies? The truth has nothing to do with Jesus. The truth has everything to do with the world, the flesh. How can anybody prosper spiritually? Do you get what I'm saying? So, and then, here we go. The question asked, what is truth? I just told you. We're not talking about some philosophical debate. We're talking about what the Word of God says. Even in the Old Testament, he is called the Amen God. So when people look at this scripture, you might say to me, okay, you just dissected that. What does that mean for me? Let's read on for a second, and then we'll put the whole thing together. So verse 26 says, And that they may recover themselves... It says, taken alive, by the way. I'm not really sure how they would do that, but they would recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive. There it is, taken captive, alive, by him at his will. Here's what you need to know about this. The Greek has a word, ana nephosin. 
that they may come to their senses or may have a sober mind, may have clarity. So the thing is, whether you want to say that the devil, it says the devil has ensnared them, working or having captured or gripped them for himself that they might accomplish his will. Now, let me ask you the question. Somebody who's been in the church or been around the church or been near the church and won't spend their time. This is the leader of the largest religious entity in the world and will not spend their time instructing, teaching. And you might say, well, okay, you know, that's never been a forte of the Catholic Church. And I'm not being insulting. I I know church history. You might say, well, what do you do with this? Now, I'm talking to people who are, they're stuck because they don't want to face the fact, and you might say, well, currently, currently the church is in a bad place. All churches, pretty much, not not 100% of them, but are in a bad place. But this one sits pretty high on the list of real trouble because, again, remember I said to you, it starts off talking about the pastors, the ministers, the leaders, And this will bleed over eventually to the rest of anyone who is involved in ministry in any capacity, way, shape, or form. But hear me out on this. That they may recover themselves. They may come to sanity, come back to their senses out of the snare that the devil has gripped them with. Well, you cannot come to the truth or the knowledge of the truth unless the mind is changed And you can't come to the truth unless the truth is being preached. So we have a real dilemma here for some of these folks that are trapped in a place where they say they must go into this entity because that's where their whole family goes. That's all they know. It's a scary world out there to actually step out and educate yourself. Real scary. What's the price of not educating yourself? And that could be in a Protestant church. That could be in a Catholic church. That could be in a mosque. It could be in a synagogue. What is the price of being ignorant? You can be misled. You can be led down a wrong path. You can be duped. You can be manipulated. And nobody actually cares about this. This is why Paul gives these instructions. Now, imagine, this is the early church, and it was being infiltrated by people who had all kinds of agendas. You've got at least the mention of Hymenus and Philetus in verse 17. But you've got other people that are mentioned and then other people that are not mentioned. Just read between the lines when Paul's addressing something to know that had to be an issue. Remember, there was no chapter and verse, so these are letters being written. Paul sits down and he starts writing. Imagine he gets this news that Wherever Timothy is pastoring, Timothy does not have the chutzpah to tell somebody, sit down and shut up. He doesn't have the chutzpah to actually teach. He's afraid a little bit of what he might say. So when he speaks, he does not speak with confidence or certainty of what he's saying. How can anyone grow in that environment? Now, there's a flip side to this. You've got the We'll call it the weak Timothy who is not really sure and he's a pushover. And then you've got people, as I mentioned, that are the opposite way. They're so over the top that there's no, there's nothing in the middle for them. They are the pastors, priests, ministers who basically lord it over the people. You will do this, you will do that. It's basically almost like a cult. And you've got to figure out that somewhere God gave these instructions through the pen and ultimately the mouth of Paul for a purpose, and that is the description of what should be happening, both for the minister and for the recipient. Now, he uses some some interesting words when he says those that oppose themselves. Who is at the root in this verse that you can actually see there may be a reason for things? It says here that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. And there is much to say about this. See, here's the problem. If you're not teaching people, I have this conversation a lot with people. If you're not teaching people about the devil and his minions, you're not doing your job because it's easy to tell people about a wonderful angel that looks out for you, right? That's easy stuff. 
oh, I have a, I have a guardian angel. Yes, and mine might be a little slow. <laughs> but you can't believe in that and say, but I don't believe this other stuff. Well, if you believe in that, you've got to believe in that. And for the radio people, I know that made a lot of sense. But if you believe in an angel, in angels, then that also means there are fallen angels. There are bad angels. There are good angels. That means the whole world is comprised of good and evil and very little in between, if you want to put it that way. So take a look again, a closer look, because I'm looking at what's in the Greek that he would capture or ensnare people that are gripped to do his will. Well, what is his will? His will is anything but God. Anything but God. That's his will. Because it is not desirous of Satan that you should be educated and know his ways. The Bible even says we're not ignorant concerning his wiles, his methods. And if he would tempt our Lord, as he did, cast yourself down and the whole, everything will belong to you. Well, wait a minute, that's kind of nutty because everything did belong to him already, right? Talk about, as I said, there's a third category, stupid. But we're reading it and we have the ability to see that Satan did not back away. The devil did not back away from tempting our Lord, in fact, three times. And what I love about this, even in the coming out of the mouth of Peter, when Peter says, no, be it far from you, Lord, because Jesus says, you know, he has to go and die, and he rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan. The point is, if we will not rebuke and close the door, just a little opening is all it takes. So, Somebody starts talking to you about climate change, and we're in church now. Let me tell you about the climate change that's going to be here on Earth when the Earth is done. <laughs> that's the real conversation about climate change we should be having. It's called hell. I don't believe in the caricature of the flames and the fire burning and the devil's wearing red, a nice, nice uh, leotard look. No. <laughs> that's all the caricature. But if the church is doing its job the pastor's doing his or her job, we will be talking about climate change. The climate change of the Bible is, as I said, no joke. Hell? And no joke. The Bible says that this old earth will be burned up. So I'm going to ask you a question. If we're teaching people that this is the fate of the earth, Peter says it, this is the fate of the earth, in order for there to be new heavens and a new earth, and people are not being taught this anywhere, then of course they're going to latch on to something that's man-made. And you can say, well, is this a real subject? Well, I'm, listen, I'm not a scientist. I can only tell you what I know and what I've read, that it takes more fossil fuel to make an electric vehicle than it does just to put fuel in your car. So you can do whatever you want with that. I'm not, I'm not chiming in on that. I've already said a mouthful. But if you're going to come to church and somebody's going to talk to you about earthquakes as your fault, instead of telling people that repentance that comes from God, which is a gift that lets the mind be open enough to receive the truth of God. Now you got my ear, but if you're not willing to do that, I don't even know why you'd go into a church that's not willing to open up a scripture like this and discuss this in a way that says this is why we are in a war over Christianity. Mainstream media takes its shots at Christians left and right. There's never an article that talks about this. There are plenty of articles about attacks on synagogues and attacks on mosques. Seldom, if ever, will you read about something pertaining to a church unless it's an event like a shooter that comes in and unless the shooter is white. So we have big problems here because every, the narrative is controlled. So I'm going to control the narrative from my pulpit. And I'm going to say to you, first, this is an application to young Timothy, the minister. It's an application to Melissa Scott or anyone who stands in the pulpit. But it's also an admonition to those people who would like to say, well, I, I don't agree with everything the church says. That's correct. You know why? Because it's also your job to do a little homework and to open up the Bible for yourself and do your own digging that when somebody says... 
X, Y, Z, whatever that statement is, that you're able to go and check it out, that you're not left to your own devices and you're certainly not, listen, when you leave here, I'm sure there's plenty of worldly things that you can listen to, you can spend hours on Instagram or social media or whatever. When you're here, we're opening up the subjects that matter the most. Why? Because most people don't even want to talk about this anymore. You know, people would love for me to spend an hour talking about social issues, talking about Israel, talking about everything else but this. And I'm telling you, that's not the way it works. Yes, I believe, just like in the days of old, that pastors should have some responsibility to chime in on things as spiritual guidance, not as an influence on scientific matters. I am not a geologist. I'm not a scientist. But I am a pretty good linguist, I think. And I can read Greek, and I can tell you that most people who are out there pontificating about these type of subjects don't have the ability to even open up the scripture I just did to show you that these are the people, when it says they oppose themselves, whether they are opposing receiving God's repentance because they can't, they won't, receiving or refusing to receive the teaching of God's word because they have an agenda in their mind, their preconceived ideas. The preacher will condemn me. The word of God condemns me. Well, hey, if the shoe fits, I suggest you put it on and walk in it because that's God's design. See, we don't change by being massaged and coddled. We change when God puts his hand into the stream of time and some event that happens that is, brings us to the eye-opening moment of being able to have the change of mind that begins. It's the beginning. It's not now I'm in and I'm done. It's the beginning of understanding that God desires something better for me and for you. And it's not necessarily what you and I can envision either. So these people who were, it says they oppose themselves, but really the grammar makes it very clear because it's in the middle voice. Yes, they oppose themselves, but whether they oppose themselves from receiving God's word or from receiving the gift of repentance from God, where, whatever that is, there was resistance there and not not being able to come to the knowledge of the truth is a huge problem for the church of Jesus Christ, for the children of God in God's church. That's a better way to say it. Why am I saying that? Because without education of this kind, without understanding of this kind, we're just like our children out in the world. How will we be able to fight and fend off? There's plenty of scripture regarding spiritual warfare. We've covered it probably ad nauseum here, and not done. But my point is, if people are completely ignorant that they could be caught in the grip of something, you know how difficult it is to tell somebody they're going the wrong way? And you tell them, you're going the wrong way. <laughs> they don't want to hear it. And unless God opens up their heart, their mind, the ability to receive... Nothing is going to happen. They're going to stay stuck in that groove. This is why when you see people, sorry to say it like this, when you see people out there and they're pontificating about stuff, whether it's current events, whether it's God, ask yourself the question, and it's the same question you can apply to just about anything. What's the agenda here? What's the motives? Why am I essentially being spoon-fed this information? Now, in my case, it's very plain. I said this before, I'll say it again. I don't know how many people will be in heaven. That's not my job. My job is not to say, oh, this ministry saved a million people and counting. I have no idea. That's not my job. That's for God to account for. Mine is to stand every single week and put the information out and keep reminding people and keep instructing, sometimes correcting, that God's ways are not our ways. And when we see resistance, when we see people who refuse the truth, let me go back and read something here that will kind of put all this. He tells Timothy, young minister, study to show thyself approved unto God. And yet, I'm asking this, it's really rhetorical. Most ministries, or whatever looks like a ministry, maybe they have just put away the book there's no need to study the book anymore. We study other things. We study every subject but the book. Or you go to a church 
where for the first two minutes the Bible is lifted up and a small something is repeated about this book that I'm holding in my hand and then for the rest of the 30 minutes we don't talk about anything that's in the book because we held it up and that's enough. So um, I guess what I'm trying to tell you is the devil is still working overtime. And how he's doing it now is, I've told you this, the media paints a picture we should all believe, the church is on the decline, nobody cares about Christianity, so you'll all get convinced because they all think we're kind of dumb. So you'll all get convinced of what you're reading, hearing, oh, I shouldn't go either because that's just, a, you know, it's a thing of the past, it's archaic, and so everybody will stop going. And they completely discount that God, who is still in power and in charge, he's got the ability to energize a dead container. He's got the ability to open the eyes of the spiritually blind. He's got all of that in his toolbox. That's what these people would just completely tell you doesn't exist. And I'm standing here talking to you as a person who God opened up and energized a dead container and put his life in it. So when I say to you, this is what God does if we open ourselves up to it. And the first place is the change of mind. But if we're in the grips of the devil, how can we come to the knowledge of the truth? Because his whole goal is to make people think they've heard the truth. God didn't say that. Surely God didn't say that, Eve. Look at the history of every single lie that the devil has told. And the ones where he's not even present because he didn't even really need to do too much. So I'm asking you, why should the church world think it's immune from this very power of the devil who can ensnare, who can put you in a trap, grip you, hold you there so you can't come to the knowledge of the truth? Or what about the people who start off? They start off coming in and they so, they're so excited because they think this is the beginning of my spiritual journey only for Satan to whisper in their ear, and trust me, this one I've seen more probably than any in this church. Because a handful of crazy people out there decide they don't like me. you got people that will go and check out who doesn't like me, what are they saying, and they're influenced by that instead of being influenced by this. There's your problem right there. When you care more about what sister big mouth gossip face is talking about or brother so-and-so because brother so-and-so is so knowledgeable but you would completely discount the message. And the message here is perfectly clear. So long as God's word is being preached, and whether it's a weaker vessel like Timothy, whether it's someone who is just a little bit on the almost overbearing side, the spectrum, there is one thing that all should be concerned with, and that is, Is God's word being put forth? And do I have a better understanding today than I did last week or a year ago? And not only that, are the ideas, are the concepts from the Bible being reinforced and hammered in? Because that's what it takes to get stuff to where it lives inside of you. The repetition, you keep hearing it over and over again. We are not ignorant of the devil's methods. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers. The whole air around us and about us, prince of the power of the air. And you think, and I think somehow that, well, the devil's, you know, in these days, the the devil's just attacking our politicians. (laughs) No, no, he's found an abode there, a permanent abode. (laughs) So what's important? I don't see Paul, by the way, coming at Timothy and saying, you, I don't see, there's nothing in here that makes that noise, by the way, but I, I'm talking about his verbiage. He's, he comes across still as someone who is full strength and yet paradoxically gentle. He gave enough correction to Timothy that I think if we were, if we were actually there and understanding in that time, there would have been more of a sense of, hmm, what's wrong with you, Timothy, Right? But instead, he says, study thyself to be, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that, my friends, is probably the biggest problem going on today. There are not enough laborers dividing the word of truth, and there are not enough people out there 
who are being told. This particular message says something very, very special, to me anyway, that without the gift of God opening up our hearts, our minds, and the ability to change, he does that. He gives us the gift to be able to change our mind. We don't do it. He starts the process. Without that, we're doomed. Because everything that we do by our own device, by our own methodology, is pretty much bound to fail. It's like the Tower of Babel. You can build something as high as you want. You're never going to get to God that way. And that's what most people try and do. And if they don't do it that way, they oppose God blatantly to his face. No, I will not listen to Timothy. I will not listen to Paul. I will not listen to put whoever's name in there. Because I don't like fill in the blanks versus what God is really saying and what God is really looking for through the mouth of Paul is that people should come to know who he is, and when they know who he is, not some caricature, not some, oh, God's this way, but from, from this book, suddenly your mind is changed to who you are relating to and why it matters so much. So yes, there are those people, now let's put this in the general form, there are those people that oppose, they will not receive the truth. Why? They're in the snare of the devil, they're, they've been ensnared, they're trapped, they cannot get out. And you notice something. I actually read in the wrong place, but where it says in verse 26 that they may recover. And I was looking in the wrong uh, footnote because in my Bible, it says that they may awake themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive, taken alive. That tells you something. If you stay in that place, and I don't know how this works. This one time I'm going to tell you, I don't know how this works. If you stay in that place where you just kind of kick back and you don't even try to, to make a run forward, escape the grips of the devil, get out of that trap. You're looking for the truth, but you can't get out. You're trapped. I don't know what to tell you, except for the person who will look to Christ, to the truth, to come to the knowledge of the truth. There is something really important, and that is this lifetime here. You may think... Whatever you want to think of your life, I'm telling you something, brief, even if a person gets 100 years down here, that's still very short in comparison to eternity. And what are we doing down here? Is it just some exercise in futility until the lights go off and you're put in the ground? Or are you learning something for a greater purpose? And if that greater purpose does exist, which it does exist, it's called heaven and eternity, then my recommendation is for those people who may be the opposers, opposing receiving the truth, or you need to seriously take a look at where you're at because time is running out for you. It's running out for the whole world. And whether that's a year, 10 years, or another 100 years is irrelevant to the fact that the choices we make down here, including starting with the ministers, starting with the pastors, to come and deliver something difficult that's not pleasing, that's not something that you say, oh, well, that really made me feel good, but here's the thing that you can feel good about. Those of you who are listening, who it matters to you, then I'd say to you, take a little page out of the Bible, not literally, uh, <laughs> and just recognize something. There are a lot of pastors, teachers, ministers out there who are not following these instructions, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing. See those three words I just repeated right there. Teach, patience, and instructing. Take me back to what I started in the first place, which is that great commission out of Matthew that says, go into the whole world and teach. It never says, go in and entertain, and entertain to show thyself approved by God, and try and be likable to people. That's not there. You know what is there? What's in this passage? The preaching of the word of God will bring people to a change of mind. And that change of mind will produce a change of heart. And that change of heart will produce a saved person who's looking unto Christ, who is the author and finisher of the faith we call Christianity. So anything short of this for the whole church world, not just Protestants, not just Catholics, anything short of this is definitely falling short of what we are supposed to do in our calling. And for those, those people who say, well, you just talked about ministers. How does this apply to me? Because in this respect, every single person in the sound of my voice will have the ability at some point 
someone is going to ask you a question. They're going to ask you why your faith matters or what your faith is about or why you even care. And in meekness, not in milk toast, not in some flim flam, not argumentative, not dogmatically, full power restrained that tells people this is the power of God and this is what God can do. But God will not operate in a container that says, I refuse to hear, I don't want to know. God can, though, and has turned those containers around. So with God, nothing is impossible. But without God, good luck. So this message sums up probably all the messages past and is probably the beacon that says, if you are not being taught, if someone's not opening up the word, you better find a place, someone that can, because your future depends on it. And that, my friends, is really why we're all here. I thank God for the opportunity to stand here and talk to you today, and I also thank God for the sanity that God has given and granted both to me and to this congregation to not succumb to the wiles of the devil on a regular daily basis like many people do. We know why we're here with a purpose and a point, so that's all I can say. Rejoice. This is indeed a day the Lord has made. I'm going to stand here and rejoice that we're all gathered to hear the truth of his word. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.